Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Robert Friedman. Uh, this session is a Global Economic Outlook, and I guess the subject is so depressing that uh, nobody wanted to, uh, to come join us this morning. <laughs> um, but for those of you who are, uh, were bold enough and awake enough to, uh, to be here, um, I'm going to promise you a very lively uh, discussion and uh, a session uh, looking at these issues. My name is Robert Friedman. I'm a senior editor at Bloomberg News in New York. I left New York uh, about a week ago. Um, our president was tr threatening to close the border with Mexico and threatening to, uh, uh, or urging the, the Fed uh, to lower interest rates and uh, doing all sorts of things that um, seem kind of crazy from the point of promoting economic growth. Um, I went and spent a week in London before I came here. Uh, that country's uh, in a state of paralysis, wanting to leave Europe and not being able to find the door. Um, and uh, that drama is still playing out. Um, as one British wag said, we may see the end of May before the end of April. Um, I, I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, tomorrow, the uh, International Monetary Fund is going to release its uh, latest forecast on the global economy. Um, and uh, in, in January, they downgraded their forecast for 2019 to 3.5% uh, global GDP growth from 3.6%. It's expected there may be a further downgrade tomorrow when they, re uh, when they uh, release their latest report. Uh, Christine Lagarde, um, the head of the IMS, gave a talk in Washington last week where she talked about what she called synchronized deceleration <laughs> of the global economy. She said uh, the global economy is in a precarious state. Um, and she cited a number of things that uh, she saw as obstacles to global growth, including Brexit, trade tensions, um, high amounts of debt uh, throughout the uh, uh, various economies, both government and, uh, and private. And, um, uh, and those were among the major uh, obstacles that she cited. Um, I hope to, uh, we'll be able to talk about um, some of those matters today um, and, uh, and address the question of whether globalization is in reverse, whether that's a bad thing for global growth. Um, and I want to um, uh, you know, hope we can open up some, to some questions as well. Uh, on Saturday, I, I went to uh, Belém in, uh, in, outside of Lisbon, wandered around uh, through the monastery and some other uh, historical monuments there, and was thinking a little bit about <coughs> how this place, Belém in particular, was the jumping off point for the first age of globalization. Um, it was the discoveries and the uh, journeys of uh, Portuguese explorers like Vasco da Gama to Africa and India and the Far East that opened up trade routes, um, brought uh, riches galore to uh, Portugal. And, um, and thinking about that, um, I realized that that was a, an unstable, unsustainable model because it was based on exploitation, slavery, colonization, um, and while it lasted for several hundred years, it, it was an unequal distribution of goods. We are now in a second age of globalization, or maybe even a third, uh, where we're beginning to see how the unequal distribution of benefits has led to rising tensions in uh, Western economies, in particular um, anti-immigrant um, uh, sentiments, nationalist sentiments, um, and have led to protests and political movements in the United States, in Britain, in France, uh, in Eastern Europe. Lots of different countries are going through these same issues. And I want to think about the question of whether the reaction to globalization is itself a damaging thing for uh, global economic growth. We are privileged to have here on the stage today four co-chairs of the Harasses event that we're at. Um, we have a, uh, a Chinese ent entrepreneur who specializes in Belt and Road projects and advising cement companies on how to upgrade their technology. 
We have a Russian engineer and political scientist who was the head of the Russian railway operation uh, co company for a decade and now runs a research institute called the Dialogue of Civilizations, which sounds very um, big. And I hope we can get some big ideas from, Small. Uh, from you. <laughs> we have a, um, uh, we have a, a Nigerian banker uh, who actually just sold his bank, but he had one million online customers in the largest banking platform in Nigeria. And we have a former journalist um, with us who uh, is the head of a trade association of stock exchanges around the world, um, and, uh, and will talk to us a little bit about uh, markets and market conditions. So, I, and we have um, wonderful geographic distribution, China, Russia, Africa, uh, England. We have excellent, thank you, Frank, uh, for excellent gender diversity, and I hope we have some diversity of opinions as well, um, which will make for a lively discussion. So, with that said, um, let, me, let me kick things off. I'm gonna ask each of uh, the four panelists up here an opening question to get their, their remarks going, and then I will ask them some further questions, and then perhaps if, we, if there's time, I hope we'll be able to answer some questions from the audience. Um, I'm gonna start with Vladimir Yakunin, um, who uh, we had a long uh, conversation over Skype a couple of weeks ago, which I found fascinating. And um, I want to begin with a, a comment that he made uh, about to me uh, in that discussion, saying that the existing model of capitalism is not sustainable. Um, and that followed a critique of the model of, of, of capitalism in Western societies, uh, of which there are many different variations. But I wondered if you could sort of elaborate a little bit on that, Vladimir, to get us started about what you see as the, as the, the, the why that model is not working and what, uh, and, and what the challenges are. Okay. May I? Yes, please. Distinguished moderator, distinguished panelists, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. You know, I will start with the uh, old Indian parable. Possibly you've heard that. When three blind men met an elephant, one was touching the nose, the other was touching the huge leg, and the third, the tail. And they described the creature. These descriptions had nothing to do with the reality. I am not an economist, and I already warned our distinguished moderator, Robert, you remember. So my approach is more polit-economic approach. When in Dialogue of Civilization Research Institute, we are trying to foresee the possible developments in terms of dialogue of civilization paradigm, we should avoid this situation of three blind men talking about the same subject, touching only the part of this subject. Yesterday, I was very much inspired by the speech of the Minister of Economic Development of this country. That was the first time when I've heard the political minister talking about economic development through the prism of development of the society. You remember he was talking about the quality of life, he was talking about health care, he was talking about education. I was very much impressed when he said 80% of the graduates of the secondary schools entered universities. While, say, in my own country, in Russia, one very prominent uh, personality stated, we do not need to prepare scientists, we need to prepare educated consumers. So, you know, from this point of view, I will make my remark. So, um, with your permission, I will give reading of just two quotes. Okay. Whatever may be said, economic globalization is a tremendous force. Among other things, it is also extremely profitable. Margaret Thatcher. Uh, the doctrine of open doors and equal opportunities declared our American President Woodrow Wilson in 1919 is a universal formula for the economic good. The dollar brings freedom, happiness, and prosperity to the nations. Those two persons, they were not aligned to some kind of romantism, I may say. And that romantism 
what a severe challenge to my mind in 2008-2009 crisis. At that time, before that, it considered that the globalization, the model of globalization which we are living in, was irreversible and it, is, it was the future of the uh, world. After this crisis, I suppose the situation drastically changed in the understanding of contemporary uh, results of the globalization. I would say that now the world is less centralized than even we can consider. We were living through the period of uh, double polar world, one polar world. What kind of world we are living now? This is the question. And the obvious answer is, look at the panelists here, and the answer is here. We don't have any more just one dominated power. We have China, we have African continent, we have India, we have Indonesia. So our vision of the development of the model is the development towards multilateralism model, not just, you know, superpower model as it was. And when we were discussing capitalism, listen, it is very essential to know what we are talking about. Of course, this capitalism has nothing to do with the classic capitalism described by Karl Marx. This is different. And of course, I suppose it is fair to say that the entire substance of capitalism is changing due to the fact that this uh, disintegration of the communist bloc as not only, you know, the system of the states, but as um, a model, socialist model, you know, absence of this challenge makes capitalism less innovative, less competitive, and more distributive. That was stated in the work of one uh, Russian economist, now uh, he is passed away already long ago, and he stated, he forecast that the salvation of the Soviet Union in 1991, when the Soviet Union was still there. But in the second part of his small work, and he was mathematical econom econ economist, he stated that absence of the challenge, absence of the competition, will play a very bad role in terms of development of the model of contemporary capitalism. It is also important to say that with these emerging countries, emerging economies, emerging powers, you know, already nobody can be the ruler. And you know, the fact that Russia cannot be wiped out from the global um, map is not the fact that the Russia is so strong or America is so weak. This is not true. But we are living in a very interconnected world, and Russia is part of this interconnected world. So everything is already not that simple as it used to be during the bipolar world. So let me, let me stop you and okay. just ask you a, 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 one quick question, and then we'll move on. Um, are you saying that the, um, the multilateral power structure that we have now with lots of different competing forces is, that, that's a fact, I think I agree with you, but is that a, a good thing? And what, what as, as Vladimir Lenin once said, what is to be done about that? Is that, uh, is, are we gonna see just co competitive warfare, um, more nationalism, uh, less, less cooperation because of that situation? Or is there some way to transcend that? No, now our attitude in dialogue of civilization is not along this line. We are just, you know, using some kind of new model to understand the contemporary world. Because the model of existing model, it, it, also, you know, theoretical models, they cannot describe the situation of today with these multi, multilateral uh, segments of power in the first place. And secondly, those theoretical models cannot provide us with the ability to see a little bit behind the horizon. So, of course, when the world was centralized and everyone knows who is the sovereign, it seems to be more structured, 
more powerful world. But remember, the Soviet Union, no, it was very structured, very strong from the point of view of even outsiders. But what happened? Why it was dissolved so fast? That means that you know, objective trends should be considered not with the usage of existing old-fashioned models, but the younger generation should try to introduce some new vision of the world and some new theoretical model. I'm talking from the point of view of researcher. OK, thank you, Vladimir. Very good. Um, let's let's um, move to, um, to China, uh, and specifically uh, to the uh, tensions between China and the United States over trade, um, which seems to be a related to what you were saying about the uh, competition between various countries around the world. Uh, Megan Lee, um, who is from Shanghai uh, and uh, started her own company uh, to give consulting and uh, other advice to Belt and Road projects around the world in many, many countries, um, has some interesting thoughts about the U.S.-China trade uh, dispute and, um, and when we talked over the phone, um, she surprised me by saying she thinks that that's actually good for both China and the U.S. in the long run. So if, can you talk a little bit about why you, why you think that and what you, how you see this playing out, why there are these tensions, whether they will get resolved, how they will get resolved? Megan? Okay. Uh, actually, I guess everyone here sitting uh, probably heard a word is time maker. It means uh, it's credited by the professor in uh, Harvard University. And he also explained the Chinese and American relationship. It's like one is <coughs> taking charge of spending money, and the other is taking charge of saving money. And one is taking charge for uh, export, and the other is taking charge for import. Actually, you know, uh, it looks very uh, fancy relationship, but actually for long term, it's in balance. So uh, from, up, from my understanding, I think it's uh, Chinese and American trade war is in, uh, inevitable. So uh, it must be happened because this relationship and this situation is uh, not balanced. Uh, but you just talk about, okay, how do I think it's probably good for both sides? Um, as you know, uh, actually, uh, for Chinese and American, uh, in past 40 years, Chinese economic is growth a lot, and uh, Chinese uh, GDP in 2018, it's almost taking 60% uh, of Americans. So probably Americans uh, have a little bit burden and stress for outside uh, from China. Um, it's kind of the trade war looks like for uh, trading and for a balance of trading, but actually it's kind of the war uh, for uh, China and American for the high technology uh, and also for the dominant power. Um, yes, of course, Chinese don't want to uh, to be number one, but American probably worried about, okay, probably China grows very fast, will have some uh, impact for, for your country. Um, but as a Chinese, and most of Chinese, we always think for from two ways. We, we all know it's a lose-lose situation for both countries. But for Chinese, we always think, okay, it's already happened. The situation is already happened. We should find some, some way to think about, OK, it has the bright way. So uh, we all know Chinese and American have a different advantage. Uh, American have very good advantage for military, for US dollar, and for high tech knowledge, and also for your culture, you know, Hollywood uh, and Harvard University, all of these things. Uh, but Chinese have very strong manufacturing industry, and also Chinese have uh, one road, one belt. Uh, you know, we have a lot of investment all over the world. Um, but after this trade, China, 
Ch most Chinese people or some most Chinese enterprise finally or started realize, oh, actually we have uh, we have already uh, have very fast uh, growth in past 40 years, but but we are still have very big gap between U.S. That is what I'm saying. It's good for us right. because we realize we are still small. We can you, you know, compare the U.S. We have a lot of gap, like high technology, innovation, and medicine. So we have to uh, work more harder. And we have to uh, recheck ourselves. And we have to do more innovation. And uh, yeah, that is what I'm saying. Okay, it's certainly, certainly um, yeah. China, with its long history, has a much better sense of long-term <laughs> thinking and planning than the United States does. Um, it seems to me that, um, and I just want to ask you this to follow up, it seems to me that um, the efforts by the United States to impose tariffs uh, on Chinese trade is counterproductive for both China and, and the U.S. It's certain GDP growth in both countries, um, and China is also decelerating. Uh, it has gone from more than 7 percent to 6.5 percent, uh, and now maybe even less than that. Uh, that's certainly a lot better than uh, Western countries, but of course it's coming from a low base. But it is going, the trend is down, and one of the reasons it's down is because of tariffs on, on, on trade. It's depressing trade. So um, you don't solve the trade imbalance just by putting tariffs up, um, and I, I, I don't see that as a particularly smart policy in terms of promoting economic growth. Uh, it's certainly hurting China, and it's also hurting farmers and other people in the United States. So um, in the short term, it seems to me that um, these, trade, these trade tensions are counterproductive. I, I, I don't, and that's why I was surprised when you said it's good, but I think you're thinking in the long term, right? Yeah. Uh, in terms right. of shifting China's competitiveness, its, its, uh, its ability to uh, save less and spend more and, and, and increase the... Um, Mm -hmm. the domestic uh, spending sector. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's, that's a very helpful framework for looking at things. Uh, Uzoma uh, Dozi um, was the uh, uh, head of um, uh, bank, Diamond Bank in Nigeria. Uh, and um, I want to ask uh, Uzoma a question uh, coming off of a uh, pretty amazing statistic that I read uh, just yesterday, actually. Um, there are 90 million people in Nigeria, a country of 200 million population. There are 90 million people living below the poverty line, below $1.90 US a day. That is more people than in China and India combined living below that level. That's pretty stunning uh, because both China and India have, you know, five, times or more population than Nigeria. In 2000, both China and India had more people below the poverty line, each, each one did, than Nigeria. So uh, Uzoma, I want to ask you this question. Um, wh why is Nigeria left behind here? Uh, globalization has, has, has had lots of benefits for China and India, lifting people out of poverty, but not for Nigeria. What, what, what's, what's the problem? And what's, in terms of distribution of the, the benefits of globalization, why is, why is Nigeria still lagging behind? Thank you very much. I and mean, that's, that's an interesting question. And it's interesting because Nigeria is a very blessed country. I mean, Nigeria has, first of all, more arable land than it needs to feed itself. It also is blessed with mineral, minerals. It's, I think it was the seventh largest oil producer one time. It actually has more gas than it has oil. So it's a gas nation, not an oil nation. And then the average age is a very young country. The average age, I think 70% of the population is under the age of 25. So it's a very young nation. And so when you compare that to countries like India and China, we actually have what we need to be self-sufficient. So for us, the difference has been, I think there's no so, uh, there's no economic development without social development. And I think that's where the problem has been. And it has been through the type of leadership that we've had. So if you take from the time we discovered oil 
before we discovered oil, Nigeria was an agricultural nation. Over 70% of GDP came from, from, from agriculture. Then we found oil, and then you saw this great shift to the cities, and agriculture, su agriculture suffered. But what underpinned that was leadership. So we had, since 19, since 19, since I was born, I think we've had over five military coups in that time. And then after that, we had governments that did not have a long-term agenda as to what they wanted to do for their people, diversifying the economy. So we relied on, we've relied oil accounts for 95% of our foreign, uh, foreign, foreign currency earnings, and that is only less than 15% of GDP. So there's no diversification of the economy. So it means that a lot of people are relying on government to feed them. And government is actually the largest um, employee of labor. So when you, when you compare the journey Nigeria has been through um, in relation to India and China, where you've seen the leadership with a long-term purpose to diversify their economy, create more jobs through private enterprise instead of gov government reliance, that's what you find. This is what we're trying to do now. And this is what we're trying to do now because we now realize that we are now dependent on global prices for oil. Um, in, in 2013, the oil price was over $100 a barrel, dropped to $30 a barrel. So it meant that immediately we had economic problems in Nigeria. We yeah, same thing in Russia, yeah. We, we, uh, had abated. So now it's a journey to diversify, but to do that you need strong leadership, you need structures in place, and you need infrastructure, which you don't have, and we also don't have capital. So it's now, we're going through a process of looking at a new model to deliver sustainable goals into the future. Yeah, but Uzoma, you, you just had an election in Nigeria, and you elected the same old guy um, to run the country who's not doing a very good job. So. What's, what's, the, what's the prospect for change? Um, uh, I mean, sometimes democracy uh, produces bad leaders, and I, uh, you know, I, uh, I can see it in, in my country, I can see it in other countries. Um, what, 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 I mean, you talk about the youth, um, uh, youthful population. I suppose I'd like to think that I have some, be optimistic about that, but what, what do you think is gonna prevent them from just becoming the same corrupt political leaders as they get a little older? <laughs> And that's a good question. So you, I think we have, we're, we're beginning to see a transition of a new economy emerging. And that new economy is definitely an economy that is being driven through technology, through digital. So if you look at the new businesses now that are being formed in Nigeria, they are actually driving their business using technology to overcome the issues of the infrastructure inefficiencies that we, that we, that we have. MTN is probably, uh, and to give an example, MTN is the biggest telecoms company, company in Africa. Despite the cost of doing business, despite the high cost of doing business in Nigeria, power, security, they are very profitable because they built a platform that over 60 million people use every day. So the opportunity there for business for Nigeria is, Nigeria is going to get out itself out of the problem, not through government, but through private enterprise, through small businesses now using modern technology to meet customers, customers, customers' needs. 20 years ago, when I went into, went into banking, everybody wanted, everybody either wanted to be a lawyer, a banker, or a doctor. Now, today, people are now starting their businesses at home, providing food, entertainment services, which they could do now easily just using technology. So I think the future of Africa and Nigeria is definitely digital, is how we use it and what role government plays in creating that enabling environment through new legislations and regulation to enable enterprise. Uh, government today is the largest employer of labor and that's not sustainable. We have over 17 million businesses in the informal sector. If they could employ one person, that would that will create 17 million new jobs for people that do not have it. That is something that government cannot do on its own. So it's def their job now is just to provide that enabling environment. And the first stage is to have a stable political pro uh, process. So 
despite the fact that we, have, we still have the same government, we've actually seen more investment coming to Nigeria because one, the, the, the elect, electoral process was, was um, stable. There was no, uh, there, there was no violence. And so it's a stable, a stable ground for, for people to do business, but the opportunity is still there in Nigeria. Okay, thank you, very good. Um, let's go to uh, our fourth uh, panelist, uh, Nandini, um, who used to be a colleague of mine at the Bloomberg News, um, uh, and now is running the uh, World Federation of Exchanges. Nandini, when we talked, you um, used a phrase that I liked, um, and I would like you to talk a little bit more about. You said exchanges are the agents of social and economic change. And I want to ask you to um, uh, both how that works and how our exchange is doing in delivering that social and economic change. Um, Robert, in starting my comments, actually, I want to quote um, from the November 2017 UN Environment World Bank Group Roadmap for Sustainable Development, um, a, long, a long title um, for really in essence, a blueprint for the future. And the authors noted that, and I'm going to quote, sustainable growth will be one of the greatest challenges of the 21st century, and that the full potential of the financial system needs to be harnessed to serve as an engine in the global economy's transition towards sustainable development. So how, and how does that play out? I was very struck by your comments, Uzuma, uh, about an enabling environment. And exchanges are just that. Um, our members are not just uh, stock exchanges. They are exchanges uh, both in derivatives and in commodities in addition uh, to equities. And the exchange is at the simplest level uh, a mechanism, a transfer mechanism. It's a place where uh, people who are seeking capital uh, to fund, raise capital, uh, companies uh, such as, uh, the, such as that, that listed on the Nigerian Stock Exchange, for example, meets the investor who has excess capital that he is seeking uh, to invest. It's a place where um, people's savings um, can be made greater uh, by pension fund managers, uh, allowing them to invest in their children's future. Um, it's a mechanism to transfer risk. Um, in the derivatives market, the derivatives markets were born uh, out of a need for farmers uh, to hedge uh, the risk, you know, of agricultural risk. So on many levels, um, exchanges are merely just a, a mechanism um, to transfer either capital uh, or uh, risk. And on another level, they are a place where capital is formed. So if you have, so one of the risks that we have um, as a society, I feel, is that the more sophisticated we grow, the, the farther away uh, we leave the fundamental principles of what works and what we need to do to engender growth um, and the future. We're a decade on now from the financial crisis. Um, the exchanges and the CCPs, um, I'm assuming almost no one in this room will know what a central counterparty is. Put your hand up if you do. Um, they, are, they sit behind the exchange and take risk out of the system. Um, were, the parts of the, were the parts of market structure that were robust? What we don't know uh, is about the future is a great deal. You know, we, we can't predict uh, when the next financial crisis will come, what it will look like, who will be affected, you know, where it, where it starts, how it will spread. That, that is one of the great unknowns. Uh, we don't know with geopolitical risk, which is an increasing phenomena, uh, and it's not just in one jurisdiction or one geography, uh, geopolitical risk and uh, transition, if you like, has been one of the abiding themes of the last three years. It plays out across every geography, from large to small, from developed markets to emerging and frontier. It used to be that geopolitical risk was something um, that you quantified in a model when you went off to invest either in a frontier market or an emerging market, and the last three years have shown that is absolutely uh, not the case. None of these things uh, we can do anything about. Um, as exchanges, um, and for most of us in this room, uh, we are some, but not all of us, not political organizations, but we all live the consequence of political decision and of political change. So what we need to do, I believe, um, as a society and as a system, as a, as a system and as a people that are pulling towards growth, is that you want to ensure that the structures uh, that surround uh, society, that surround your financial system, are best equipped to handle stress, 
to enable uh, growth um, and to support and, and to, to be democratic. We should be open, fair, transparent uh, in the way uh, that we work towards a better society. Going to your question specifically on what exchanges are doing as agents of change, one fact that always, one number that always surprises me, and so I use it often, is a year, a year and a half ago, we did a piece of work with the UN, and we discovered um, that contrary to all our expectations, there were more exchanges now than there were 20 years ago. Who would have thought? Um, and so when we look around the world, um, I can think of markets uh, where the exchange isn't a member. Uh, on this panel, for example, the Russia, Moscow exchange is a member, Lagos Stock Exchange, the Nigerian Stock Exchange based in Lagos is a member. I have eight members in China. Um, but I cannot think, I can think of markets or countries where the exchange isn't a member, but I can't think of, an ex of a market or a country where there isn't an exchange. In terms of challenge, I'm going to say that they are considerable um, and they are evolutionary. So, you know, today, uh, the concept of listing a company coming to market, an issuer, and listing is well known. But yet, delistings are greater than ever before. That's partly because um, as our regulatory framework has become stronger um, and has wrapped us around with greater security, the, 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 the requirement to be listed is more onerous. So companies are delisting. Uh, in record numbers. Um, as exchanges, uh, the, the tragedy is as the number of exchanges grows uh, to facilitate capital formation, the growth of fast, uh, capital formation, companies are deserting the market uh, and they're seeking um, to raise that capital um, in, in, other, in other places, places that are not necessarily open uh, to the investor, to the man on the street. Um, as the exchange model um, has grown uh, more recognized uh, for its integrity, um, we see the rise and rise of uh, new asset classes um, that, put them, that call themselves exchanges. And the new asset class, I mean, we're not at the WFE particularly dogmatic um, about uh, whether something should be allowed or not. We just say um, if, it's a if, it's a, if it's a product and it's a security and people want to trade it, it should be traded, but it needs to be traded in an environment where there is integrity of markets, where there is oversight, where investors are protected at the heart of the mandate of the platform, and the word exchange has specific legal connotations. So I would assume that you have no crypto exchanges on your... In there your are no history. crypto exchanges in the world. There are numerous crypto platforms, platforms but there is yeah, right. no exchange right. in the world... Right. Okay, um, <clears throat> I want to uh, take some questions from the audience in just a minute, but let me just um, uh, pose this, this question to the panel. Um, I came across an interesting statistic about, um, uh, about wealth distribution in, uh, in the United States, and I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how it applies to other countries, but I, I, I think there's probably a similar pattern. Since 1980, the uh, top 1% of, of the incomes of, of the top 1% in the United States tripled. The top 10% doubled. And the people at the bottom 60% were flat. No change. This is, to me, an unsustainable situation where the rich are getting richer and the poor are staying poor. Maybe not getting poorer, but staying poor. Um, and this is happening in the United States, which has been since 1980, a, a fantastic growth story in terms of economic growth, but it's not distributed well. And some of that inequality of distribution certainly fed into the election of Donald Trump. Um, it is uh, feeding into uh, the Brexit vote in, in the UK, people feeling left behind, threatened, um, challenged by, uh, by globalization. Um, and it is uh, happening uh, elsewhere in the world where you see these kinds of uh, uh, unequal distributions of wealth. It's happening in China, a communist country, um, where you're seeing a, a, a wider spread between the top and the bottom. Um, and and I, I, I think that's probably unsustainable in the long term for China, too. So what, what is it that governments and people can do to help turn that around and spread the, the benefits of growth more widely uh, and take care of the aspirations, the job needs, the, uh, the, the, the health of their, of their citizens. 
Vladimir, you have some thoughts about that? Listen, if I could uh, answer directly, I would be Nobel laureate, not just uh, Vladimir Yikun. I assume this is true in Russia yeah. too, yes? You have all these... <laughs> this is everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Gini coefficient, yeah. since the beginning of observation, is the highest today. I can add to what you've said, eight richest families, they possess the income of the 50% of the poorest part of the world. It is not sustainable, I completely agree with you. But it is not just because uh, of some political leader cannot do or cannot understand that. That is exactly what we started with. The model is not sustainable. It is not me. This is again Krudman, Stiglitz, this is Rome Club, you know that. They are stating that. So we need politicians and managers able to see openly at this situation and to promote the ideas, to study, to research, to introduce what kind of model should be. And you know, even if you're mentioning Trump, Trump was elected, to my mind, by the Belt of the United States of America. Why? Because you just mentioned the middle class is declining, yes. and it was the basis for democratic state to develop. So again, we should change the model. We should consider. It is not possible just to make it like that. It possibly demands a lot of timing, a lot of efforts, but we need to have this political consciousness, uh, economic consciousness. We should not be that politically correct. You know, if it is my country, I cannot say anything because, you know, others, they worse. This is absolutely different. The world is global. Globalization is irreversible process. This is an objective process. The model of globalization should be changed. Any other thoughts from a panel about is it going to take a revolution uh, to change this, or is it better tax laws, or is it um, what, 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 what needs to be done in, in, in China? What would you, how would you address this problem if you were I think running the country? I think talking about the globalization, what happened in China, we have to mention one belt, one road, it's, it's one important strategy. Uh, as we know, you know, uh, last month, uh, our president, Mr. Xi, visited I Italy and France, and they have already signed 2.5 billion euro with Italy and also three, uh, 30, 30 billion uh, with, uh, with France. Uh, they bought 300 airplanes from China. So uh, this is a story happened in Europe last month, and in the past five years, actually, One Belt, One Road uh, has already invested all over the world, especially the uh, emerging uh, countries. So it's already uh, has uh, six trillion US dollars. So uh, actually, I am the people get a lot of benefit from this strategy. So I have already done uh, one Belt, One Road uh, project in Egypt, in Pakistan, and also in Turkey, and also some countries uh, in UAE. So um, uh, when I, I, I would like to share my experience when I first time uh, visited Pakistan 10 years ago. Actually, uh, the road is not very well developed, and also uh, the transportation on the road is very interesting. The first time I realized, oh, on the road they have the horses, they have camel, they have cars, they have mo uh, motorcycles, they have bike, all of the things on the road, and also the buses is, is full of the people, even on the top. So I, I think it should change. They need more uh, development. Even, you know, I sit in the five-star hotel, have my dinner, suddenly, the, the power is off. But that was true in China 30 years ago. You had yeah, bicycles it's and, true, and horse drawn right. carts and yeah, right. Definitely. Uh, why I have this uh, experience? Because it happens in maybe 50 years ago or 60 years ago in China. But uh, as w I think all of the youth have already seen a lot of development in China. It's well, there's no, doubt, there's no doubt that globalization has brought tremendous development uh, to, to China and has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, mm. and that's certainly a, 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 a wonderful yeah. thing that has happened. What I'm asking now is about the next stage, where um, uh, is, is the government delivering um, enough services? One of the reasons Chinese people save so much money is because they're afraid that when they get old, the government's not going to be able to take care of them. There's gonna have, they're not going to be able to... Um, uh, 
uh, you know, pay for what they need to pay. So mm -hmm. is it a question of the, of, of the Chinese government being um, more, more socialist in terms of distributing the wealth, or is it okay that there's a, 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 all these billionaires and millionaires in China? Is that a good thing? I mean, how, how is that playing out? Is that going to be, cause political tension inside China? Uh, I didn't really understand so, what... So you do have a, 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 a lot of rich people in China yeah. making a lot of money. Okay. And then you have a lot of factory workers who are doing better than they used to be doing. They're not living in poverty, but they're still struggling, right? They're still, uh, you know, um, they can't buy everything they need. So there's, a, there's an unequal distribution of wealth is what we're talking okay, about. Okay, I mean, there are so, still some people is poor and some people is yeah, very rich. Right. Is that okay or is that is that something that... I think it's already a little bit changes in the past 40, day, 40 years, you know. Uh, probably uh, 50 years ago, there are a lot of big gap between right. rich people and the poor people. Even the poor people, you know, they don't have so much food and clothes. But now, uh, the middle class grows a lot. And uh, we don't have so much difference, even in the very poor, uh, you know, uh, cities or very poor village. They, they have the opportunity to go to a very good education, and they also have the, the food, you know, the Chinese online e-commerce is very developed. So they, they can buy anything online, and it's very quickly. So I think it's, it's changed. It's really changed a lot. You should visit Shanghai and China I and have. see it, I then have, you will yeah. know, oh, oh my God, it's like New York or no, I have. even, yeah. Uzoma, do you, uh, you sort of already answered this question in, in the beginning, but just any more thoughts about, about what it's going to take to, to turn this situation around in, in Nigeria, in Africa, mm -hmm. uh, and elsewhere? Because so, I think it's an important... Uh, so I'll give you an example. Maybe two weeks ago or three weeks ago, maybe two or three weeks ago, I bought coffee online from Amazon. It took four days to get to Lagos. Now, when I compare the price, it's only four days. It's coffee from some, somewhere in maybe Kenya. I'm not even sure. But what I have done is I have also now displaced the coffee farmer in Nigeria because I've now taken foreign exchange to do that. And that's just globalization. But globalization, globalization working for somebody else because they have the right structures in place. And it's something that it's irreversible. You can't stop it because you can't stop individuals that you've empowered to be able to do what they want regardless of where they, where they are. So it means as a country, you have to now create that enabling environment to be competitive for people to want to use your resources. So it means reskilling people. And we have that opportunity because we have a very young nation, so you can reskill and, re and you can retool. I think the corporate structures are also under threat to even exchanges in Nigeria because today, as a small business, if I want to raise money, I have alternative funds, crowdfunding. They are, and because what are exchanges for? Exchanges for raising capital and trust, creating trust. But now, trust, the definition of trust is different. If I, um, crowd, people trust crowdfunding or trust the people than trust establishments where to get information, you have to go through a certain rites of passage. And then um, being part of a member now becomes very onerous. Meanwhile, you can, you can, you can access it in, in, in different ways. So it means that both the private and the public sector, public sector and even the corporate uh, structures have to now find a new way of dealing with the new economy, which is their the new consumers, because they have choice, not just local, but global. Mm -hmm. Audience, any questions out here? Do we have a microphone? There's a hand up over there. Any other questions? There's a hand up over here oh, and here, yeah. Uh, back there first. Thank you all. Can you please introduce yourself?
Sorry, except for what? So uh, the question, the, the observation is that uh, income uh, is not the only measure of, um, of wealth and that there's uh, lots of opportunities um, available in terms of uh, access to the internet, uh, cheaper air travel, um, and uh, I, 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 let me just come back to you, come back to that and then I'll let anybody on the panel answer. It seems to me that um, you do need to have some income in order to buy that airplane ticket, in order to buy a computer or access to, uh, to online. Um, so those um, benefits, which are, are, are great, um, are still not accessible to um, large numbers of people around the world. I think, that, I think you recognize that in your question and, and are asking how, to, how can we better distribute that. Um, any thoughts about, uh, Zoma, you, you, deal, you had uh, one million um, uh, online banking customers in a poor country. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, how the technology um, that allowed for that has um, made things possible in terms of um, better distribution of, of uh, uh, wealth to, and, and access to people? I think one of the biggest problems in Africa is information and how reliable that information is. I will tell you that in Nigeria, about 60% of people are actually in the informal sector. So I don't know how much people earn. I, I, so, so the statistics are very, very, are very vague. So one way to solve that problem is to is inclusion. So you have to have an inclusion strategy. Inclusion. How do you, inclusion. Yeah, yeah. How do you bring, and it's not just about financial inclusion, it's social inclusion. Um, how many people, so, um, so that who's paying taxes, who is um, accessing services, that's on a, a way to find out what the average um, um, in, in income is income. We don't, we, we don't actually know that. So um, when I was in Diamond Bank, the first thought was how do we get people included? Give them a mobile phone, give them access, give them an account so that you can now start, and give them an account and let's put them into the digital economy because once you have that, you can now start seeing what people are actually doing. Because the cash economy is, you, you can never tell what are you doing, what services are you, what services are you actually acquiring. But when it's, when it's digital, you know exactly how much it's paying for utilities, if it's paying for any utilities, and where we now need, to, with that information, where we now need to allocate our resources to improve the lives of people. That is not happening because, one, you have a lot of people in the formal sector, you're being, the taxation is for, from a few, few people, and there's no incentive to, come in, to be included, because to be included means to be taxed. But I'm, without I'm, guessing, I'm guessing that a lot of people in the informal sector have one of these, no? They all, yes, they do. Yeah. Yes. Um, and so what is, the, what is the penetration rate for uh, mobile phones? Mobile phones is, uh, uh, in Nigeria, we have 90 million mobile phones, so really half the population. Right. Is, so that's still half that doesn't have access to, to, one, to one of these. Um, your question is a good one, and I think, um, uh, uh, did you want to? Hey. Yeah, sure, please. So I suppose you agree with me, uh, and I agree with you. All positive elements of globalization and existing system, I completely agree with you. For. But at the same time, I should point out that, for example, in the United States, through the period of observation, long period of observation, the proportion of the wage Wagers in the price of the product is the lowest. That means that when we are talking about distribution of the wealth, that is not sustainable with the existing situation. It is not possible just to rely that the big corporations, say in Nigeria, they limit their profit to share the wealth with the poor people in Nigeria. Not possible. So from this point of view, you know, the existing system has pros and cons. But unfortunately, it is going down. So from this point of view, it is not correct to talk about distribution of the wealth. 
but the ability to possess proper income. And if it is in, even in America is declining, what can be said about Africa? Okay, question over here. Please, Please close. Yourself. Speak louder because yes. you know the you know the the hearing is absolutely poor yes. here. <laughs> Two ways. Okay, a very pessimistic uh, view about uh, the future, but a very good question. Um, does anybody want to talk about whether they th what they think about the risk of, of, of war? Um, uh, you, you, Vladimir, you talked a little bit about how uh, we have no longer a two superpowers, but I think the scenario you're talking about is that you have multiple superpowers and, and, and alliances forming, which is, I think, true uh, uh, in terms of um, the allies that the United States is seeking uh, in the Middle East and elsewhere, the Belt and Road Project is not a military operation by any stretch of the imagination, but it is going to create some loyalties. That's the, that's, that's the idea of it. Do you see this getting out of control at some point? Listen, in dialogue of civilization lately, we were predicting several elements. We predicted the crisis of 2008. We predicted the crisis of migration. And now we predicted uh, the appearance of uh, re-emergence of national states, which Claude was referring to. But to my mind, because the world changed and globalization is objective process, I don't foresee the actual possibility for blocks to become the, that kind of you know, adversary blocks just to fight each other up to the wars, for example, not trade wars, but actual wars, because we all interconnected. It is not that possible. What is possible that, you know, regionally, countries can come closer to each other because it is much easier to understand Nigeria and Kenya saying, you know, than, you know, United States and Nigeria. You, you do understand, this is obvious differences, civilizational differences, mental differences. But this kind of competition could be a positive one. If there is no one who consider, if I am, that is my interest, and I neglect all the interests of the others, that is not competition. This is not fair competition, at least. Right, Robert? Yes, but you're assuming a rational world. For 60 years, the United States and, and, and the Soviet Union had missiles pointed at each other, and nobody ever pushed a button because yep. they realized they realized what balance, okay. balance, yeah. correct. But um, I'm not convinced that uh, that people will be so rational with non-nuclear weapons. But just I think 
somebody like Trump can easily get uh, angry and do something that irrational. And yes, I yeah. do understand your you know assessment of yeah. Trump, but you know at the beginning I would say the, the same thing about I'm not, <laughs> I'm not you know admire of a Trump. Right. But Trump, he is not just on himself. He was a reflection yes. of some difficulties, internal difficulties, inside American society. Yes. He is not fool. He will not push the button. I don't trust him. Because he wants to get but elected. Yeah. what he is doing sometimes, yeah. that is elephant in the glass store. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Megan, you, what do yeah. you think about uh, this? I think talking about the risk of the globalization, I would like to mention uh, the risk in future is still uncertainty because, you know, before globalization, we still, we all as an individual or uh, as a human being are uh, based on the economic system or political system or culture system. It's still a very simple system. But to become globalization, it's become a very complicated system. So complicated, it means uncertainty. It means on so many things. We cannot decide it. It happens everywhere, every day, but to, we, all of the countries will uh, influenced by the uncertainty. But to the other hand, you know, it also means opportunity. Because you don't know what will happen, then it will some opportunities there. So I would like to say risky sometimes, or risk sometimes, it also means opportunity. So that is my understanding. So we don't uh, afraid of any uh, uh, risk. We just hug, hug the future and give a um, big hug for the opportunities. So. All right. Well, I think we're going to end on that op uh, optimistic note um, and hope that there is no uh, no wars that break out in the next year. I just want to ask my panel one quick question: uh, yes or no answer. One year from now, will GDP growth be more or less than 3.5 percent? More or less than 3.5 percent, which is what it is now. Yeah, that was the estimate. Which way, which way is it going one year from now? Listen, from now, I suppose it will go up. Up. Yeah, because, you know, this is the situation when it is, you know, a little bit declined. But, you know, okay. generally speaking. Nandini? I hope it goes up. 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 I don't think so. I think that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's one vote. We have. So at least we have some diversity of opinion. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to vote on your side. It will be down. Um, but uh, um, thank you all, uh, panel, uh, for wonderful uh, observations and thoughts from a variety of different perspectives and geographies. Uh, thank you, audience, for coming and listening. And uh, let's give a round of applause to uh, our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.